not every action deserves a reaction. And Pat has really taught me to look at the whole board and assess before I make my next move. And I love that. You're going to love the conversation we have with my guest today, Brooke Walsh. She's a local Birmingham girl who's bounced around a little bit, spent a little time in politics, spent a little time in finance, but found what she really, really loves to do and what she's really, really good at in real estate. Starts with her grandmother and her grandfather who were moguls here in Birmingham in the real estate industry that she used to go around with them when she was 10, 11 years old. And just that story. And then all of a sudden how she's a thriving real estate agent here in Birmingham. She's got rentals. She's one of the few real estate agents that I know that actually invests in real estate. So you're going to love this conversation with Brooke Wall. Brooke, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. So we were talking off camera and we've got a lot of things and a lot of like common business things that we like doing and we will get into that. But first, I want to know who you are. Tell me about you. So I know I know a pretty good bit about you just based off research and mutual friends, you know, real we're both real good friends with Christopher Green Farrow, oh, wonderful human being. And uh, yes. and so just so tell me who you are, like, where are you from? What did you grow up doing? Just where, all those different things. Give me yeah. the background. I'm from Birmingham, been here most of my life. I spent a short period of time in Washington, D.C. and a little bit of time in New York, but love Birmingham and was excited to come back after school. Um, I have four kids, married to someone who's not from Birmingham, but he's lived here the majority of his life now or time now. And so he claims Birmingham as home, second home. And we really enjoy raising our family here. Um, I grew up with very close family, my grandparents and my parents are big influences in my life. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. And they have all been involved in real estate, um, in their careers. So I would say real estate has been in my blood and something that I grew up around, always was very attracted to at a young age. I was shadowing my grandmother, mm. spending my weekends going to the office with her and doing agent on duty responsibilities or holding houses open. Uh, so my parents love to bring back pictures and videos of me, you know, drawing out floor plans and then uh, sales pitch sheets that I had as a, you know, 10 year old, um, so anyways, and it's fun because actually a lot of the people that I get to work with now knew me at that age. So it's a real full circle moment in the industry when I get to co-op with agents who have watched me grow up and yeah. it's no surprise to them that I'm doing exactly what I'm doing now. So, so you grew up in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. Where did you, did you go to college? Where'd you go to college? I did. I went to Auburn. Okay. Yes. You, so when you went to Auburn, so growing up, I, from the time I was six, I knew what I wanted to do. So like this real estate, if someone would ask you at six to 12 to 15 years old, and they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would you have said? So I really wanted to go to law school is what I thought. Okay. And so I was kind of going down that path or mm -hmm. thinking that in my head. Um, doesn't surprise me that I still ended up in real estate because it was definitely a passion at a young age. And I think that one of my favorite parts about what I do is the heavier negotiating. Mm, and okay. that's really what was attractive to me in wanting to go to law school. I mean, I used to write, you know, dissertations to my parents and mail it to my dad's office if I wanted something where I would really like lay out the argument on why I should get a family dog. That's right. And, you know, what the reasons were, you know, his potential knows and what I could see as a hurdle and um, go ahead and kind of come up with a counter argument. It was just a one, one way conversation. That's awesome. um, but anyway, so I always had a strong desire to negotiate. Yeah. And I think coupling that with wanting to help people and utilizing my negotiation skills mm -hmm. to do so. Um, so real estate was always in the background. I think I had a variety of other ideas that probably right. ebbed and flowed on what I wanted to do and definitely changed my major several times. I didn't go in with like a, you know, very direct path. Um, right. So, yeah. So when you left, what did you do when you left Auburn? Graduated and then went where? I moved back to Birmingham. Okay. Um, I spent a little bit of time in D.C., but then I moved back to Birmingham and my husband is a couple of years older than me. Mm -hmm. And so he was here in medical school 
And we got married pretty soon after I graduated. And then I was in finance, just um, that was part of what I studied in school okay. and was a comfortable background for me. So um, what'd you do in finance? What was your job? I worked for Cadence Bank and wealth okay. management. Yeah. And um, so I was here and really waiting to see where he was going to match for his residency. That's right. A lot of my desire to get into real estate was pending if we were going to be in Birmingham or if we were going to be somewhere else. Right. And some of the cities that were being considered would have been a very different real estate market. Um, I wasn't exactly dying to sell houses in Rochester, Minnesota. No. So it, um, it really was kind of waiting on that for a short period of time. And right. then as soon as he matched in Birmingham and we knew we would be here, um, I you know jumped right in and went to get started. So you mentioned before we flipped on the cameras, New York, you lived in New York. What'd you do there? Just for some short stints and yeah. um, summer internship. And then actually we spent like three months there a couple of years ago. My husband was um, working at Sloan Kettering, the cancer okay. center. So we went back up and he was there for a longer period of time. So the kids and I got to go for a couple of months. Okay. So you bring up a great topic and I think this is something that a lot of people need to hear, want to hear and have questions about. So talk about internships. I think there's two, I love interns and I hate interns. Okay. I love interns because in my opinion, if you can find an intern, it is a long interview. You get a chance to see if they can work and they know what they're doing and they really want it. Cause I tell all people that intern with us, you're either going to love this and say, this is what I want to do, right. or you're going to hate this and, and you say, know. this is what I don't want to do. Both of them are wins. Yeah. So internship, what kind of internship did you do up there? I worked for um, a lobbying firm in DC and then they also had an office in New York. So I worked for them for two summers. Okay. Actually did some consulting work for them during the school year. Okay. So between one summer and the next, I actually kept the job, um, which was really fun for me in college. I had the opportunity to travel to a couple of conferences and it was really great exposure um, to still be studying yeah. in school, but then, you know, able to travel with this group and go to some dinners and meet some key people. I think it was a great experience for me, which speaking to what you're saying, I mean, I find a lot of value in internships. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, if I had advice to give someone in school or at, in that phase of life, I think that you should absolutely, absolutely. be engaging in internships and really seeking different opportunities. Um, you know, I think that if you know exactly what you want to do, there's value in diff different sure. types of internships. And if you have no idea what you want to do, there's also value. I think it's really more about allowing yourself to get the experience of working with someone under someone on a team. You know, what does that look like to be in different environments and have to really stretch yourself um, you know, when it's some, when it's a task that you want to do, when it's a task right. that you don't want to do. And I think the, the real value, I know there's some jokes that are made often about people doing unpaid internships in certain cultures, not understanding yeah. why people do that. But I actually think that when there's not money attached and it's really just, you know, personal satisfaction on the job that you did, but there's no compensation to tie to it, you really learn a lot about yourself if you're the one that's working. And then I think you learn a lot about people observing them work when there's not going to be, you know, monetary benefit yeah. to them. Um, I think you really see people's worth work ethic displayed pretty clearly. Right. So we've got a little bit of the finance. We've mm -hmm. got a little bit, it sounds like politics and yeah. And they're br a brief, brief session. Okay. So yeah. why, so it sounds like, and then correct me if I'm wrong. sounds like you tried, the finance, you tried, it sounds like a middle, little bit of the, the politics stuff. Why real estate? Why did you get back to that? And I know you've got a deep background, but what triggered you to get into that field? Yeah, I really just want to be a hostage negotiator. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at all yeah. of those things, that's what I want to do. Um, but being back in Birmingham, but like I mentioned earlier, my grandparents were very influential people in my life. Um, my granddad was in real estate and then my grandmother came from real estate lineage as well. Her dad had a very successful real estate company in Birmingham. And then she was in the business as well. She sold for 
43 years oh, in the residential gosh, space. That's incredible. And so when I was living in Birmingham and just married, she was still in the business, kind of phasing out. But I realized I'd probably be able to catch her for about a year or two. Um, and so there was, I would say, great appeal in being able to work with her, have opportunity to work um, in the same industry. And that was definitely a an exciting opportunity and also just like a moment of pride for me to be able to get to do that with her. So what kind of real estate do you do? What do you, what do you buy and sell? Primarily residential. Okay. But I would say I have a wide variety of clients and a wide variety of people that I represent um, in terms of what their interests are. I, you know, famously had a month where I sold a three and a half million dollar house and a $32,000 house um, in the same month. And I love to think about that because both of the people were, you know, just as important to me, but it really um, kind of displayed the range, I think, that I can have. So. $32 million. Yeah. $3 million and 32000 Yeah. We talked about this earlier also. Tell me about the stage in your life when you worked the hardest, meaning the longest hours. What was that? Because I've got it. It was 05. No, excuse me. It was 05, 06. Yeah. I worked a ton of hours, didn't make any money, got a lot of experience. What was the time of your life when you just absolutely worked the hardest? Yeah. I like that you can point to the exact time. I um, I track everything. I think mm -hmm. that's really the only way to look at what you were doing that was working, what wasn't working, and then propel forward in a better version of yourself. So I, I look at everything – Every Monday, I look at the week that I just had mm -hmm. and then the upcoming week, and I analyze both. And then every quarter, I go back, I go forward, and then every year, of course, as well. So because of that, I can very specifically answer that question. 2019, for whatever reason. That wasn't long ago. No, it was definitely the point where I had the most friction in wanting to grow, and I was working harder, not smarter, and it really took – deep diving into what I was doing that needed, you know, refining in the process to just be better. And then 2020, it was like all gas, no breaks, but in the best of ways, I really feel like I made some critical adjustments and found so much more satisfaction personally in the schedule. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, of course, balance is a little bit of a mirage, but it is there was just a much better flow. Um, I felt like I was just really in a better rhythm. And so I would say maybe even leading up to that, you know, hitting the point, but 2019 yeah. was sort of the breaking point where I realized, you know, I want to do more. I want to, you know, be more successful, have a larger book of business, help more people. Um, I also you know, want to still find value in my personal life and with my kids specifically. And how am I going to do all of that? Um, thankfully for me, another part of kind of when I got into real estate is that I, um, like I told you, I was in finance before and I was kind of waiting on when I could make that jump and waiting on Tyler's um, confirmation of being in Birmingham. And so by the time I decided to, to take my real estate license exam, I surprisingly, which was a great surprise, but found out that I was expecting my oldest daughter. <laughs> I knew that was coming, yeah. Yeah, the same day that I passed my real estate test. I said I got two positive tests in one day. Jeez, I was only right. expecting That's one, it. but um, they both came. And honestly, it was a really great blessing because like the two just took off. My sure. like career in real estate and career in motherhood were simultaneously running on you know tracks next to each other and that's always given me great perspective on how am i doing and you know where am i in both um so yeah how old your oldest daughter my oldest is nine okay and then i have a seven-year-old little boy and a four-year-old girl and a two-year-old girl wow yeah so nine to two perfect mm -hmm. So residential real estate, are you the broker? Who do you work with? Who do you work for? Tell me like, cause there's all these different things. You got real estate agents and you got some that like a Keller Williams and you got EXP right. and then you have, you know, like Gusty, Gusty Goulitz has yeah. been on here. Gusty's great. So you've got all those different things. Tell me about the company or group that you work with or yeah. work for. I have my broker's license okay. here and I actually um, 
have my broker's license in North Carolina as well. So in Birmingham, I work at Arc Realty. Yep. Based out of the Mount Brook office, Mount Brook Village. And I've been there for eight years. Um, I started at Realty South, okay. which was really a nod to my grandmother. She was there and had yeah. been there for most of her career. Um, of course, it had changed names a couple of times, yeah. changed ownership. But she had really been there. And um, so it was, you know, an easy, easy landing spot for yeah. me. Um, but as I started to grow in the business and really identify what I wanted long term, local ownership was important to me. And so um, I met with Tommy Brigham, yep. who Tommy's great. owned ARC. And Tommy's a salesman, no <laughs> surprise. So Tommy, you know, gave me the hard pitch, but it also really seemed like the right fit for me and for the goals of what I wanted to accomplish. Um, I was still really, you know, a rookie at the time, I would say. Mm -hmm. And moving to ARC was a critical decision to really be able to launch my career to where I wanted to see it go. So um, that was a great, great move. So I'm at the Mount Brook office here. And then in North Carolina, I joined a brokerage that is really exceptional. Um, it's called Cashers Valley Real Estate. Mm -hmm. And there are six other brokers there. Um, and it's it's been really enjoyable for me to have a completely different set of you know, colleagues and people that I work with in a different market. They all have amazing perspective because they had successful businesses in other parts of right. the country. So Atlanta, Sarasota, um, Charleston. And it's also interesting because on the agent side, a lot of the perception is that all real estate agents are the same, all real estate com not. companies are the same, yeah. all real estate markets, you know, operate in the same way, not even in value or, you know, what people are looking for or how the market is doing more and how the agents work together or don't work together. I don't know. Um, and it's, it's not that. And so it's very nice for me to have the two different perspectives. Um, and I think they complement each other well for just a well-rounded experience and how I approach the business. Okay. So you're at the Mountain Brook office, mm -hmm. which is a suburb of Birmingham for those that don't know. You said you've got a, your broker's license. Yes. So, so like you've got real estate agents and then you've got brokers totally different people yes. but you can do both so are I you I don't act as a managing broker I just don't. have my broker's license So are, who is there someone that's the head of the Arc Realty office in Mountain Brook is that you No Tommy's technically listed as our Tommy's the head guy so broker, you, you we are, let him take a good amount of vacations so That's right if he So you're the head, you're you're one of the agents in that office do you have yes. people that work with you or under you excuse me Yes with me um very much side by side. Julia is my assistant and we have worked together for four years mm -hmm. now. She is wonderful. Um, Y'all crossed paths when she was working. She used to work for a wedding planner in town. What's her last name? Donald now. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know exactly who she is. Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. So if I had a silver bullet, it's Julia. Absolutely. That's awesome. Um, because we just have a famously wonderful relationship working together. Mm -hmm. Um, she's really my like daily hype girl and also the person that keeps everything running That's in a very huge. efficient manner. And yeah. so, you know, even talking about when I was referencing 2019, I went through a couple of years recognizing the push pull of what are things that I'm doing really well? What are things I'm not doing well? Is there a person that could fit a role, you know, to, to help do some of these things and assist doing some of these things, who would that be? Yeah. Um, I tested a few different, I wouldn't say people, but even just sort of methods and, and outsourcing certain tasks in the business and never felt satisfied with the results that I was achieving. And so Julia and I partnering together just worked really well for her timing and my timing. It, it, just came together pretty seamlessly and um we have not looked back since then and so the person that you met earlier sierra she's yes. my person she does a wonderful job she's my assistant so talking about julia why is it so important in real estate to have an assistant for what you do yeah i think it's critical for my time and making best use of that and then i think it also delivers a better client experience so 
Julia and I really run a very tight ship in the process behind the scenes. And some of that our clients will see and observe directly. And I think that that's always communicated in, you know, the type of service they feel like they're receiving. But also, you know, many things that happen behind the scenes that people don't know or they're not aware of when working with a real estate agent. And so for me, having Julia, it keeps our week extremely organized. So we move through things very effectively. And then it, I mean, it really eliminates balls being dropped. Um, I would say, you know, critical on organization and critical on best use of time. And it, the goal, and I feel like it's often achieved, is that it allows for an extremely seamless process for the clients to feel like they're just being ushered through, always educated, always given the tools and the information that they need to be able to handle, you know, what they need to handle or to make the best decision at that time. But because of that, you know, impact that Julia has on my business, I'm able to fully be present with clients. I never feel like I don't wear an Apple watch. I don't feel like I need to be looking at my phone when I'm with mm, someone. Yeah. You know, if I'm showing you a house or we're meeting about listing your house, you're the only client of that time or yeah. of that moment because I know that Julia's there handling all incoming emails, sure. all phone calls, and making sure that everything's happening in a seamless manner. And then I think she's really provided a huge relief on workload that allows me to spend more time with my kids. Sure. And I think that that's something that a lot of other real estate agents would benefit from or would find very helpful. An assistant for me has helped me do the things that I do well, because a lot of times we need to hire someone that does things well that we don't do well. Yeah. I've done all the things that Sierra has done, but you've done all the things that Julia's done, but she probably does them what better than you at this point. But there yeah. are a lot of things that Julia can't do or probably could do, but you do a lot better than she does. Yeah. And so what you can do is you can simultaneously work for one client and she's getting two great people. Yeah. And the rhythm and routine that you, that you mentioned of whatever the, being the, the talking to the title people or talking to the this yeah. or talking to the bank or whatever, those things, she can handle those things. Yes. Whereas you don't have to handle those things. And then you guys have a, a synchronization of talking about this thing, that thing. Cause it's yes. a lot of times in real estate, it's rinse and repeat in a lot of different ways. Sure. So every client's different, but there's always title. There's always banking. Yeah. There's always financing. There's always negotiation. There's always those types of things. So back to real estate, as far as just like selling, where do all, where do most of your leads come from? So 99% of my clients in 2023, and this is consistent with year over year numbers, but 99% of people last year came from previous clients. So I have a really strong referral business and that's really how I like it. That's the model that I've run off of well. Um, you know, I don't have to vet my clients sure. once they call me because the first call is immediately, hey, this is Thomas. Christopher gave me your number, said Boom. that you were really wonderful yeah. and I can't move without calling you or I need you to list my house. Um, and so I obviously loved working with Christopher and valued having him as a client. So it's like, Great, moving you know right on. Um, I really actually see my book of business or my clients as my marketing force. So I market to them, but I don't feel like I need to market to everybody else. Do you still spend money in marketing? Yes. Doing some. what? What do you spend the most doing? I do some print advertisement, um, but I mostly I mostly spend my marketing dollars on my clients. I would mm. say. How do you spend your marketing dollars on your clients? I very specifically lay out a gift schedule for the year, of things that I'm taking and delivering to my clients. Anytime someone sends me a specific referral, you know, handwritten note and a, a gift card to my favorite restaurant or something that feels more personalized to their neighborhood or something I know that they like, um, it's never a waste of time for me to sit and really think about something that would be valuable sure. to the person that I'm giving it to. It's never a branded gift. You don't need a Brookwall Stanley cup in yeah. your car to drink your morning coffee. Um, 
but I would love for you to go to Bottega and right. have dinner and, you know, maybe not you. That's right. <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> you so get a break from the kitchen. Have you yeah. ever read the book Giftology? I have read some, some excerpts from it. Okay. So one of the things he talks about in the book is he said exactly what you said. You don't want to give them a brick wall, monogram, Stanley Cup. But what you could do, let's just use, okay, Neely Butler owns yeah. Maria Me. You probably know her. Mm -hmm. I know her. So it would be really cool to give Neely a Maria Me embroidered something. Sure. Yeah. And that's one of the things that we picked up. Now, we still give embroidered gifts that, that right. we have, like something that's unique to us, yeah. whatever. But giving someone a gift that's got their thing on there, yeah. their company, their logo, their whatever, speaks volumes. Number one, it's one of a kind. Yeah. You had to spend the extra money to do it one of a kind. And number two, it's them. Yeah. And because I like wearing my brand, whether it be Table and Time, Meal Fit, yes. Cox Capital, Walk Cox Point, whatever it is we're, we're yeah. doing. I love wearing my brand. I'm, I would imagine you probably do too. Yeah. So you're not going to put another real estate company sticker on the back of your, right. <laughs> back of your car. I do like the agents that send football calendars because then I get to look at this. Exactly. Oh, exactly. So, um, <laughs> Okay, so all your most that's all a good your idea. Clients, I like that yeah, idea. It's it's been it's been really effective for us. Yeah. Um, and it shows that. Well, I give you a great example. I definitely like the the personal approach. I mean, Julia would laugh if she was sitting here or she listens to this. But, I mean, I will spend significant time trying to hunt something down that I think is super targeted or specific to person. I have a client who collects cars and loves cars, and you bought him a car. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> Not yet. Kind of. So he mentioned this one car that maybe was the first car that he owned or it was, for whatever reason, very special to him. It's like, that's something that I store in my head. Sure. And then, um, of course, now I can't remember the name of the Hot Wheels, mm -hmm. did a collaboration on these super specific cars. And they sold out in minutes. So, of course, I had to get on eBay and track down some person. And this exorbitant amount of money yeah, on, a, for this on a tiny three inch car. car. Yeah. But obviously, he has, you know, 10 in his parking garage at his house that I sold. That little one sits on his desk. And I like that because That's it awesome. always reminds him, you know, that I went, went that extra mile to find it, hunt it down. We had a client, a uh, guy that we did some business with. He's come up here and talked a couple of times. And he got our Table and Time logo, took it, put it on a beautiful leather notebook that you insert a notebook into. Yeah. And had it etched on the front. It's probably oh, fun. a 90 or or $100 nice real yeah. leather. And it's got my logo on it. Love it. It's wonderful. Yeah. I'm not giving that away. I'm right. keeping it. It sits on my desk. Right. And I've already got a notebook, but I love yeah. it. Yeah. Because he, it was ex exclusive Thoughtful. to me and he thought, thought about me. Yeah. Um, going back, what do you wish you would have done at 25 that you that you didn't do that looking back ahead, if I'd have done that, I'd have been done this better? Hmm. Good question. You know, I really don't have many, like, I mean, I have daily regrets. From sure. Bad decisions. Things. Yeah. Something I ate. I don't know. Um, but like looking back retrospectively at various phases of my life at that age, I, I don't find a ton of regret. Um, I think that at any point you could always find me saying that I just want to spend more time with my kids. Mm -hmm. My granddad and, and both of my grandparents, but specifically my granddad, was one of the most influential people in my entire life. And he really valued time more than anyone I've ever seen. And the way that he displayed that in relationships and how freely he gave of his time, he really understood the value and the fact that it was the ultimate gift that you could give someone is just sure. being with them, giving them your time. And so he did that really well with me um, and you know made a forever impression and lasting impact on my life. So, yeah, I would say, you know, just always trying to figure out if I'm being there with my kids for the right, right. things and um, for the meaningful things. So, you know, maybe at 25, I would say to answer the question, land the plane, recognizing that it was more of a marathon and less of a sprint. I didn't have to get there immediately or by a certain age, sure. certain number. 
Um, I honestly, I mean, I feel pretty satisfied. I feel like I've been able to accomplish a lot in those last nine years. But right. um, yeah, just valuing time. So as a real estate agent, do you yourself invest in real estate? I do. How so? I have bought and sold several houses that I've flipped, yeah. renovated, and then um, sold months later and worked with various partners or investors if it was something I didn't want to take on personally. Mm -hmm. But I really enjoyed that. There's times in the market that are better than others. Absolutely. Um, so there was a period of time where I was able to do multiple projects at one time, which was really fun. And as you probably can imagine or know, it's easier to scale when you're doing that. You've got, you know, the same crew that's able to move from one project yeah. to the next and you're able to keep them busy, which is nice and you get great work out of, out of people in that way. Um, buying and holding on to rental properties. So how many do you have? Two right now. All right. So are they short term or long term rental? One is a long term rental and the other is a short term rental. Okay. So, so I've got, we've got apartments that we own mm -hmm. and we've got a certain spread. What is your spread on your long term rental? Meaning, twelve hundred. Okay, so yeah, twelve hundred bucks. 1, so you got a mortgage, and so the rent that you charge is twelve hundred dollars more. Do you manage it yourself, or have somebody that does it? I manage that myself. Do you really? Mm -hmm. Huh? Where is it located in Birmingham? What city? In Mountain Brook. Okay, in Mountain Brook. Okay, so it's pretty easy to manage. I would imagine. Yeah. What about the short term rental? Tell me about that. Short term rental is in North Carolina, and I mostly manage that myself. You we do? have yes, I manage the the actual rentals. Yeah. Um, we have you know, maintenance men and people yeah, sure. that take care of the property during the off season since it's more of a vacation property. So we have people that will winterize the house and, you know, handle any type of maintenance when we're not there, which is great. Um, but the spread on that is about $6,000 a month. That's incredible. Okay. So it's in North Carolina. When is the high season there? Is it summer? July through October is really peak season there. Okay. So July through October. So what about November through June? What is it like there? Is it just like no one comes or like once a week, once a month? What does it look like there? Yeah, it's definitely much slower, but there's sort of a different demographic of renters that want to stay, usually for longer periods of time. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's still pretty consistent. Yeah. The peak season rent is so significant that it it averages out to the six averages out to 6k a month yeah. over the course of the year wow that's incredible do you use airbnb i do not there are restrictions on that particular property to be able to use it so i don't but i've used it in the past mm -hmm. on rental condos in birmingham yeah and i've i have several clients that love it and heavily rely on the airbnb system so you know i think that there's value there really i i think there's value as a real estate investor or someone who wants to own rental property in whatever system allows you to just jump in. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want Airbnb versus another VRBO or whatever the other company is, or just hiring a management company altogether to be such a hurdle that someone just says, I'm, I'm not going to do that. So if you don't use Airbnb, what do you do up there to like, advertise or put yeah, it on, post it or whatever. Up there it's interesting because it's part of a specific community. There is sort of a rental portal within the community. Okay. So you're able to tap into that, which is really nice. Do you have a lot of repeat guests there? Yes. Yeah. So Johnny and their family comes the third week in July every year and they when they leave, they book it for the next year. Correct. Yeah. There's a group in Panama City that owns a bunch of bigger houses down there, like you know, nice. eight or ten bedrooms. 15, yeah. 20 grand a month or a week to, to rent it. And then they've got like, but they, awesome. you leave, they book it for the next right. year when they leave, before they leave. Guess. Yeah, same thing. So you've mentioned your grandparents. Yes. In the real estate. I don't know if this is your, would be this person or not. Who is your biggest like quote unquote mentor in real estate? At one time, it would have been my granddad mm -hmm. and my grandmother. Um, my grandmother, my granddad's not alive. My grandmother still is. And I'm still extremely close to her. We talk every day and she's still a very big part of my life. Um, but I would say th the real estate mentorship, you know, they were yeah. probably two of my biggest mentors. Now I would say a friend, Pat Henry. Okay. I know Pat. Yeah. I met Pat the other day. Yeah. His office used to be right here. Um, pretty close. Huh. 
Yeah. So Pat is the president of Daniel Corporation yep. and runs big development operation based out of Birmingham, but they have projects all over. Pat's an incredible mentor. He's really a great listener and just speaks from a very logical perspective on, you know, pulling thoughts together to make big decisions, small decisions. I really like his approach in how he communicates with other people. And that's very evident in how he's respected you know, in the community, right. in the development world. Um, and I always say if I wasn't working for myself, I would absolutely be working for Pat. <laughs> so him being one of your most important mentors, what is your most important mentor taught you? What's the one thing that you feel like he's taught you that's that's been important? Not every action deserves a reaction. Huh. Explain. I think that often in business and specifically in real estate, you are the recipient of other people's problems, situations that present themselves that appear to need your intervention or, you know, something that seems like it happens to you in an affliction manner. And Pat has really taught me to look at the whole board sure. and assess before I make my next move. And That's I love great. that. What you know, I'll transition to some technical things. Okay? okay. So what is the most common mistake that home buyers make these days? Not interviewing multiple real estate agents. Perfect. That's great. You're big investors. We're in quarter one of 2024. Yeah. What are your big investors looking at right now? Big investors right now are looking at the market and trying to assess their next move. I would say um, the flip market is evolving or is changing. Margins are changing, especially if you're financing to get specific. So I think assessing business models, kind of taking this first quarter to see what interest rates do, if this is a cash only game, or if they're able to finance and still make margins work. Um, I would say that model historically has still done really well in Birmingham. People are really still appreciating a finished product house and are willing to pay for that. I do think that some investors in Birmingham, clients that I've worked with and, and plenty of other people that I've seen and observed their work are probably pushing the limits on what people are willing to pay for while trying to keep their margins pretty comfortable. Sure. And I, I say that in, you know, just meaning that I, th I think people are going to have to continue to produce really solid work because people are willing to pay, buyers are willing to pay for a you know premium that someone else has flipped and completed the project, but they have high expectations on quality of finish level and what they should expect. You have a lot of people that come to you and say, man, the market's bad right now. Of course, yeah. What do you say? I don't believe the market is bad right now. The market is evolving, and I think it's actually really important that – everyone feels educated in that manner. I, I probably feel like I gatekeep information as it relates to the real estate market on social media, et cetera. And it's not really that I don't want to share and tell her secrets, but it first is critical to me that it is delivered to my clients. So I keep very good contact and have close relationships with all of my clients, and I want them to feel informed because I really see myself as an advisor for their assets, which happen to be in real estate, whether it's just one single family home that they own and occupy, or it's someone who, you know, owns one house, is going to buy a condo for their aging parents that are, you know, moving to Birmingham. They also have a lake property or a mountain house, and they want me to be able to kind of assess the whole portfolio, sure. the whole picture. And then, you know, a lot of people are really wanting to uh, less big box investors and more individuals, I would say, are wanting to get into um, long-term rentals. So if you were a real estate investor and not an agent, what would you invest in? I really like the long-term rental sector. I think that it's more of a buy and hold strategy but I feel like if it's done in the right areas, you can generate great returns. And I think that you, you know, have good diversity in your portfolio at any time, depending on where certain properties are, you could convert them to short-term rentals mm -hmm. as long as there are not restrictions. So I like that. I think that for, you know, like we were talking about, I think sometimes the barrier to entry scares people. It's much easier for them to just write a check to, a financial advisor with Northwestern yeah. that's going to 
plug their money into a conservative mutual fund. And while that works for some people, and that's great, I think that if they felt like they could do that in real estate, specifically investing their money in real estate and not buying stock in other companies, they would do it. So I think if you try to get people into real estate investing, the long-term approach seems to be the best place to start, Mm -hmm. in my opinion. Um, They don't need as many people on the management side. They can really work out the kinks of, you know, who they use for services and kind of get their systems in place. Yeah. I think that's important. So other than the, other than real estate, you got the long-term, they got the short-term. Where do you and your husband invest outside of those two things? We invest in the market some. Yeah. I would say I have a good advisor that is very helpful and is really brilliant, but also takes a very tactical approach to a lot of our financial picture and what we are doing. And so I definitely don't feel like anything I'm doing is stagnant, even if I'm parking money somewhere that I've planned to park it for 25 years. You know, his approach really feels like you're always on offense. Do you guys just dollar cost average every month? Yes. Do you take advantage of like a liquidity access line in investing with what you guys do? I don't. Okay. Do you know what that is? I don't. I'm vaguely familiar, but I don't have personal experience. So... For investors, this is a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I learned about this about three or four years ago, and it has made us a ton of money in investing because what we do is we take whatever our market exposure is. So we dollar cost average every month, just like you, but we're also in real estate. You know, the whole diversification thing, you obviously got to do what you know. So we dollar cost average also, but we take the money that we have in the market and you can do... I imagine you can't with Schwab. We do Morgan Stanley. Yeah. You have a, what they call a liquidity access line. And I can borrow from that amount. So let's just use a good round number simply because the math is easy. So say you have a million dollars in your brokerage account. Most companies will allow you to borrow 70% of that amount. Yeah. So if you you have up to, let's just say $700,000. You have $700,000 that you can borrow off of that. You have a rate that you have, and it's typically, you know, seven, right now it's 7 or 8%, which is not great. Sure. But if you can have something that's a 10, 15, 18% margin, yeah, that's great. So we'll take, like, for example, we do work with flippers just like you do. Yeah. So, but with the flippers, I have a guy that says, hey, I need $100,000 for this thing. And he'll give me a rate of 15% over six months, simple interest, not, not annualized. Great. Which is good. So it's in essence annualized. It's thirty percent. Yeah. Okay. So I'll borrow a hundred thousand dollars off my LAL, give him the hundred, he'll pay me back in six months, give me fifteen thousand extra, and really say the rate's eight percent. I've paid four thousand dollars in interest, and I've got a spread of eleven thousand dollars. Yeah. And it is. I'm telling you, if you've got short term now, obviously you don't want to yeah. use that for for buy and hold stuff. Sure. But if you've got short term things. Yeah. It is wonderful. And we use that a lot with what we're doing. And it's been really, really good. I just wondered, because not many people do it. I got another buddy that does it, but not many people do it. I didn't know yeah, if interesting. exposed to that. I've not personally done that. Yeah, I'll but it's, it. it's an option if you got it. I, yeah. I would assume they do it. So everybody that's successful has had a break in some way. You know, I'll create my own break. No, there's been something that's happened yeah. that was like that big dollar amount that you made the introduction that happened. That, yeah. What was your biggest break in real estate? I interviewed for a listing against a veteran agent who would be considered one of the best, if not the best, I consider her one of the best, in the market in Birmingham. And I knew I was interviewing against her. Big listing in terms of list price, big client, high expectations. And I got the listing And I feel that was the big break for me in confidence because I knew, hey, going head to head with anyone, I'm just as capable or I can do it. Um, And then, of course, I think it it also provided some validation in the market. Oh, street cred. Yeah. Yeah. And so I kind of look back at that one client with just – a lot of gratitude and think that was a huge opportunity for me. And they don't 
think of it like that because I've had some conversation with them about it. But um, they they thought of it as a very objective decision, but it was a huge moment in my career for confidence and for validation in the market. That's great. Social, social media, all those things. It's huge right now. Do you use any sort of platform as far as posting that you leverage business off of, that you get stuff out there? What do you, what's your favorite, what's your favorite social platform? Polarizing opinion, but I really do not like social media for real estate Mm -hmm. in what I do. Everyone is doing it and I'm not trying to be an intentional contrarian, but I've always found in life that I just forge my own path. And I don't think that the marketing I see around me is done very well with social media. I think that it dilutes the experience that I had with a client if I have to post about it all over the internet. I think it dilutes their experience and their privacy. And truthfully, you know, I don't need the details of their real estate transaction or portfolio displayed on social media for my business and they don't need it for theirs. So I really like to keep that very private. I utilize Instagram, although I'm really not that engaged with it. Mm-hmm. Um, my, I have some fabulous marketing guys and we had a meeting and we were talking about this very specific thing. And I said, gosh, I don't know. Do I, I mean, do I have to do this? And they said, I don't know, Brooke, do you? And I like the way they asked it back to me. And I said, no. And then they said, well, then you know what? Don't do it. Don't do like, it. You're right. So I really just try to instinctively operate in business off of what feels right and what feels best to me. And the great thing about that is that what does work for someone else is great for them and it may not work for me, but I don't love social media. I, I utilize Instagram periodically and I do laugh when I'm in the grocery store or somewhere and run into someone there. Are you still in real estate? I'm like, yeah, yeah sure am. Just a little bit, Just you know. Just a little bit. Um, but I'm past that. I don't. Right. I don't take offense to it. I'm like, oh, you know. I guess some people have to post things, but a, a lot of what I see on real estate, I'm like, Instagram's just like the same house in four different iterations of posting, right? Or it's other people's listings. I mean, I have a lot of agents that post my listings. I'm like, that's great. Sweet, Appreciate go it. for it. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Love it. Are you a reader? Yes. Okay. If you had two books on your desk mm. to give away. To anyone and everyone that walked in your office, what would they be? 12 week year. Oh, gr- I kn- okay. Sure. So, look, okay. So, you started talking about, yeah, look last week, look this week, look Big quarter. 12 week year. Okay. That I read like that years ago. Going home with everyone. And, oh my gosh, the second book, what is it? Think fast, act slow. Thinking fast and slow. Thinking fast and slow. Yeah. Kenneman? No. Those two. Really? Why the second one? I know the first one. So twelve week year. Let's give let me give the boost. Twelve week year. So the guy that wrote I put twelve that week in people's year. People's stockings for yeah. Christmas. <laughs> the guy that wrote twelve week year says, break up your week, break up your year into twelve week years. Yes. So that you have a a time frame to to achieve your goals. Take a week off and then redo it again, and then that way you yeah. get four years in one in one year. Yes. It's an extremely intense process. But it takes a lot of planning. But yeah. what it does, it forces you to be extremely intentional I in those it. 12 weeks. Yeah, I love it. Um, anyone I speak to in real estate in discussion and wanting to know what is the one thing that you do and or what is the one thing that you did for this year to be successful? And I say I did 1,000 things consistently. Mm, yeah. Um, and the 12-week year approach has really forced me to do that. It is intense, but... I like that. I lean into intense things a lot. And it's actually very freeing at the same time because once you're in the process of thinking quarterly, you're really not worried about what happens after that. So at this exact moment, like I need to get to March 22nd, really March 31st, but I usually like to end the quarter with some sort of week off or vacation and that's spring break. So for me, it's from now until March 22nd. And I... I know exactly what goals I want to accomplish during that time. I know which clients I want to have a house and have found a house by then. Um, I know, you know, exactly how I plan to spend my money in that quarter. I know exactly how I plan to spend my time. And so I think that it makes every day feel like it has more purpose. Mm -hmm. And I, I just find when people 
I like setting goals and I like thinking in that way. But when people take the New Year's resolution approach to mm. their business, it just doesn't work. And you find a lot of people on January 3rd that are in the office, you know, writing out lists and reaching out to their clients in real estate, you know, checking in with people and coming up with some sort of probably a social media post yeah. or email or something. Um, and they're writing out big sales goals and throwing out numbers. And then you check in with them. And I mean, real estate agents have a short shelf life in the year, but April, and it's like, they're not even on target. They're not even close to right. hitting their goals. You check in with them by October, they're already checked out for the rest of the year, just waiting to get to January and so start, start that start cycle again. all over yeah. again. So I finally find it extremely ineffective. And so for me, and Julia as well, I mean, she really loves the approach because it it keeps us constantly tracking. And so there's just no bad day, no bad week. There's no week that's so great that it takes our focus as well. And bad as well. Yeah. So it's just, you're always kind of looking at this is, you know, this is the 12 weeks that I'm focused on right now. I'm not worried about anything beyond that. And, you know, I know that if something happened that I wasn't pleased with, I've got the rest of this time in front of me to continue sure. forward towards accomplishing what I want to do. So looking back, this is a great question for you. Looking back over 2023, how have you changed this past year? I would say I have really become more confident in who I am. And I think that's important every year as we age. Um, in what way? Kind of what I was saying earlier. I didn't think I'm an intentional contrarian, but I have really always loved, you know, the Emerson approach of just two paths diverge from one and you're taking the path less traveled. I like to forge my own way. I'm not afraid of doing something different than other people and, you know, oftentimes prefer that. And so I think that, you know, that's great. And I've always found myself to be a confident person, but as you continue to age and see some of the effects, you know, of forging your own path, you have to really focus on that confidence and know that you're doing the right thing. Um, even if you don't see the short-term benefits. What has caused the right, the rise in confidence though? Like I think seeing what I'm doing that's working well for yeah. me and feeling really you know, enthusiastic about my business and my personal life and where it is. And yeah, I think just, you know, feeling that excitement over, I really love where I am in life and what I'm doing. And, you know, no day is perfect or perfectly no. balanced, but I feel really proud of my kids and what they're doing at their various ages and stages of life. And particularly my older kids, you know, as they're further along in elementary school and pursuing their own passions in school or athletics, kind of seeing right. seeing them evolve is a, a great thing for me to observe. And then I think just seeing my business, I, I really love the people that I get to work with. And I, I believe that if I put any 10 people that – are in my client base in this room and didn't tell you what they had in common, you would be able to gather certain commonalities sure. and common threads just by talking to the people. And so if they're out in the world and the community and their own successful businesses and spaces that they live and operate in as a reflection of me, I've got a great thing going. That's perfect. Yeah. What is the hardest part about what you do? Managing expectation, I think that there is no level of experience in this process that should overlook or skip that. So my clients that are buying their very first house with, you know, hard save dollars, they're being gifted money to buy a house, they're buying their fifth house, they're downsizing from their family house for 30 years and, you know, moving into what they think is probably their final resting place or their last place to live. Um, I just think every person still needs to have more of a handheld approach where you're really educating them on the process and what they should expect. And, right. you know, that takes a lot of energy and a lot of effort. Because everybody's different. Yeah. 
So before we go, a handful of questions that are super okay. quick answers. Rapid fire. I like so it. So <laughs> what's your go-to activity with your kids? Monster tag. Whoa. We run around and just tag and talk. Love it. <laughs> okay. Often at night before they're supposed to go to bed. What is your favorite vacation that you've taken? We have gone to Europe the last two summers with our kids okay. for a little bit of a longer period of time than we usually would. And those two vacations have really stood out. They made impressions on my kids in the way that they view the world and their sense of adventure and their flexibility. And um, they were incredible experiences. Where'd you go in Europe? Italy, Austria, London, France. Gotcha. Spain. Okay. Think about this next question. What is your favorite vacation that you've never taken? Meaning I want to go there? Okay. Um, favorite vacation I've never taken. I would really like to go to Thailand and probably a lot of Southern Asia. Hmm. It's hard to get to and very a lot of to. barriers to entry when you start planning the trip, especially if you think about taking children. But it's definitely on my list. What's the most important thing you do? to make sure that your kids are not getting neglected? Start the day, end the day with the kids. I think I really make effort to be the one to take them to school in the morning and be there in that morning process as they're getting ready, eating breakfast, be there with them for that. Um, my nanny comes before they leave for school, but I would say 90% of the time, I'm the one that takes them and gets their day started in the carpool line. And then trying to end, end the day with them as well, even if I have dinner plans or something, just spending some time with them and really asking, you know, a couple of intentional questions at the end of the day. That's good. Them. That's the best. That's the best answer I've heard in a long time. That's really good. Um, before we wrap up, where can people find you? If they wanted to find you on social, cause you're not on social media. I am on social media. <laughs> just might but, not, but might not respond. But if I'm someone kidding. wanted to find you and either they wanted to do an internship with you or yeah, they fine. wanted to, wanted you to sell their house yeah. or I don't know anything that, Breaks to like, business. Where could they find you? Like a eight six seven. Yeah, five, by three oh nine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, like email, website, whatever. Yeah, I mean Brooke at brookwall dot com is my email. That's pretty easy to. Okay, remember. how do you spell wall? W a h l. W a h l. That's yeah. important. Okay. Brooke zero at, five four four <laughs> seven one seven zero four. So, it doesn't so ring Brooke like at brookwall dot com. Yeah. Any kind of website, I anything have like that. A brookwall real estate Instagram. Okay. You can find me. Great there. Perfect. Hey, thanks so much. <laughs> hey, um, thank you. This, this was, was great. I really appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Thanks.